and thank you for coming. Today we are talking about teaching testable CNA skills with our speaker, Julie Reynolds, more famously known as Nurse Jar. I'm Dr. Charlene Brown. I'm the CEO and founder of CNA Simulations, and we're the ones sponsoring this webinar. So before we get started, I want to make sure you know about next month's webinar. Well, actually, today's webinar is being recorded. We'll share the recording after the event, and we'll have Q&A after Nurse Jar's presentation. Um, our next webinar is on Wednesday, December 14th at 4 p.m. Eastern. It's on preparing CNA students for the behavioral complexity and unpredictability of dementia. So Dr. Gaelic is this incredible, brilliant um, nursing professor at the University of Maryland Nursing School. She chairs the Department of Organizational Systems and Adult Health, and she has spent the majority of her career and her research working with CNAs who are working in nursing homes um, professionally. And she has a lot of great things to share about how you can prepare students for some of the challenges she sees them deal with in nursing homes, um, particularly with patients who have de dementia. Um, I'm gonna just take a moment to introduce those of you who are new to CNA simulations to explain what we are and what we do. So CNA simulations, we create these self-paced online um, virtual clinical simulations for CNA skills. So the simulations have a CNA student who's making decisions on behalf of Teresa or Lynn or any of the other CNA student characters we have in simulation with an older adult who then reacts to them. So they're making all the decisions in a simulated care experience where they can make mistakes and get real-time feedback from our fictional CNA instructor, Nurse Johnson, who helps them understand um, when they make incorrect decisions and gives them feedback, uh, positive or negative, based on the choices they make throughout the care encounter. Um, and then when they're done, students get to practice their documentation and uh, reflect on the care they delivered. And so far, we're hearing that instructors love it. So 100% of instructors agreed that the simulations improve student knowledge and critical thinking skills, which is our main goal. So now let's talk about Nurse Jar, who I first met as Julie Reynolds. Um, and when we were sort of talking about CNA simulations back when CNA simulations was literally just an idea, it was during the pandemic and we had these amazing conversations. And at some point I realized that she was the, inf the famous Nurse Jar from all of these incredible CNA skills videos that I had been using. And I had been hearing about from so many other nurse aid instructors around the country. So Julie is literally a YouTube sensation in this world of CNA instructors and CNA students. Thousands of CNA students attribute their exam pass rates to her virtual help through the videos that she's created. She's also created um, a board game, I think the first ever board game for CNA education. And she's the author of multiple books, including Smash That CNA Exam and Nurse Jar's Book of CNA Clinical Scenarios. So I am deeply honored and pleased that Nurse Jar, this national nurse aid education leader who is known for her innovation and learning tools, has agreed to be our speaker today. And with that, I am going to stop sharing and turn it over to her for her to share her screen and walk us through her presentation. Welcome, Julie, we're so glad to have you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, let's see, okay, let me try to pull up my screen here for you all. I cannot, if you want me to run through your slides, I can, but I look, I look um, like I think I got it. Can y'all see it? Yes, it's perfect. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, okay, yeah. awesome, awesome. So what's up everyone? Good evening. I am super excited to be here uh, with you all today. I just wanna give Dr. Charlene Brown a huge, huge shout out and many, many thank yous and virtual hugs. I'm giving you a virtual hug for giving me this great opportunity to meet and speak with fellow nurse aid instructors. I love it, I love it, I love it. 
It's an honor, Charlene, to be uh, a guest speaker on your platform. So thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much. So for those of you who have not yet visited CNN, cnasimulations.com, I strongly, strongly urge you to do so, so you can sign up for a free demo and get placed on their mailing list so you can be receive updates, okay? As Charlene said, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic hit us hard and it hit us unexpectedly. Um, Charlene was one of few, very few, if any other people that, um, you know, pioneered, um, giving nurse aid instructors and students alike um, a, a strategic learning and training platform to help prepare our students for clinical during the pandemic, right? Because you know, we were all going crazy trying to figure out what we were gonna do when it came to clinicals, right? Um, and to also um, help them prep for their CNA certification exam um, this platform offers a library of virtual self-paced interactive CNA simulations. So again, I strongly advise you to visit cnasimulations.com. Not right now, wait till after the presentation, wait till after the webinar, but to visit and sign up for your demo, okay? All right, guys, so I would love for this uh, webinar to be interactive. So I'm going to ask if you do not mind sharing in the chat what state or country you're joining in from and who your authorized administrator is. This will give me a good idea of who I'm talking to, okay? And while y'all are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and get started with the first couple of introductory slides that I have for you all. So um, what I want to do for those of you who do not know me, you've never heard of me, um, I want to give you just a short self-introduction. Then I want to introduce you to my 7C framework on becoming inimitable. And we're going to talk about the importance of training consistency and where the heck to start when it comes to teaching our students the train or teaching them, training them on the testable skills, okay? What is a good starting point? Then we're gonna dive into reality versus testing. And then I'm gonna share with you some ideas that can help you get started on developing your own innovative, out of the box, creative um, tools that can not only help you train on the testable skills, but also help your students learn and help them to retain that information for testing. And then I just wanna close it out with the brief blurb on networking, okay? So who am I? Who is Nurse Jar? I am a mother of four. I've been, uh, my youngest is uh, seen here in the photo um, with me on this slide. I've been widowed for about two and a half years. I'm a military veteran of 16 years, US Army. Who? And um, actually, the, I received my nursing education through the military. I'm a certified nurse manager, a CWAPI certified professional. I'm Vora Wound Care certified. I'm a certified CPR instructor. I'm a NACSAP instructor. And I'm a YouTube micro influencer and an author, um, like Charlene said, of several different uh, nurse aid training guides that you can find on Amazon, you can also purchase them on Amazon, okay? All right, so by a show of hands, and let's be honest, okay? By a show of hands, how many of you struggle or have challenges with training your students the testable skills in any aspect, right? Whether it be, um, you know, teaching, trying to get students to learn the proper names of the supplies, uh, trying to get them to learn what supplies to collect uh, with, you know, the different uh, skills, uh, the skills itself, the steps, uh, the 
indirect care skills, right? Those are a booger, right? So by a show of hands, let's see how many people are struggling with that. Y'all can do that also in the chat, okay? So I see I have some headmaster, prometric, uh, prometric, let's see, prometric. So a lot of prometric and headmaster, do we have, oh, Credentia, there we go, Credentia and Pearson view. I was just getting re ready to ask, do we have any Credentia or Pearson view up in here? Okay, so I see a couple of hands raised for having challenges with teaching the testable skills. And I understand you, I feel you 100%. Um, once upon a time, that was me, I was, I was challenged, right, with trying to figure out not only what to teach um, the students when it came to testable skills, but how to teach them, right? And what's, what are good methods to help the students retain that information for testing? So over the years, I, um, I've spoken with hundreds of instructors across the globe and I recognized that there was always two main issues that instructors had or two main concerns. One, student engagement or lack thereof, right? And two, the lack of either internal and or external resources that they could use to help them train, right? On the testable skills. So I was there, I understand and hopefully um, from my presentation, you'll be able to carry something away from you that will help diminish those challenges or eliminate them completely, okay? So seven years ago, I began my journey to becoming inimitable, right? Because I wanted to be second to none. Okay, I want it to be that instructor in which all other instructors wanted to follow into my footsteps and also become inimitable. I want it to be a mentor uh, to other instructors and I want it to be an inspiration. So I began that journey seven years ago and my only trouble, my only problem was figuring out how to do it, right? So I decided that I, I started thinking about how we build houses. I even thought about our bodies, right? Our body um, begins with the framework, right? That gives us stability and gives us movement, right? And then building houses, right? That has to have a foundation and then it has to have a framework built upon that foundation before the walls and the ceilings and the insulation and the windows can be placed, right? So I said, well, you know what? I need a foundation. So I want to have an impact statement as my foundation. And on the clipboard on the slide, you can see what my impact statement is, which is your students' outcome is the reflection of your training and leadership. I'm gonna say it again, just in case somebody didn't hear. Your students' outcome is the reflection of your training and leadership. Now, I know a lot of y'all are probably sitting there scratching your head saying, hold up, wait a minute. Don't our students have a responsibility for their outcome? Don't they play a role? And the answer to that question is yes. 100% they do, okay? But if their outcome is a reflection of our training and leadership, overall, we are held accountable. We're gonna be accountable for how they perform at testing. And if you think about it, after that student, our students test, the NAE, the nurse aid evaluator um, is gonna say, ask themselves one question and two different ways, right? They're either going to ask themselves, huh, I wonder who the heck was that student's instructor? Or, hmm, 
man, I wonder who the heck that student's instructor was, right? So that's what they're going to be thinking about. They're going to be thinking about who the instructor was, how did they teach them? What did they teach them? They're not going to be asking themselves, hmm, I wonder if that CNA study, right? So this is the impact that I chose for myself. And I also that it would be very impactful for other nurse aid instructors, right? So every morning, I actually have this um, on a little sticky note on my desk. Every morning, I look at that statement and I read it once, twice, three times, right? Because that helps motivate me to be the best instructor that I can be. This help motivates me to maintain my inimitability, okay? Now getting there really isn't such a challenge, but maintaining it is, okay? So now that I have my foundation, which was my impact statement, now I could start building my framework. And so I have seven components that I chose that I thought were particularly um, beneficial for or to nurse aid instructors. Communication, competence, confidence, charisma, creativity, consistency, and control. Okay, so as nurses, we know that communication and not just communication, but effective communication is vital. It plays a huge role in our career. We have to communicate with our patients, effectively communicate with their family members, with the doctors, with each other, right? And without our effective communication, there will be a lot of mistakes made just as with our instruction, right? If we do not effectively communicate with our students, our students are gonna end up making a lot of mistakes, not only during the training, but also during testing. Now, the next two components I actually link together, competence and confidence, right? As instructors, trainers, and teachers, we have to be competent and what we are teaching and training and instructing our students on, okay? We have to be. Um, when we're competent, we're confident in our performance and in our instruction. The more competence we, or competent we are, the more confidence we will be when we train our students. And then charisma, a lot of y'all are probably thinking, what does charisma have to do with it? It has a lot to do with bonding with our students, making that connection. This charisma, your uh, charismatic presentation, right, is the start of student engagement. Once your students are able to bond with you, they are going to be hanging, okay, or sitting on the edge of their seats hanging on to every single word that you say. Every single, every single word that you spit out your mouth, they're gonna be waiting for more, okay? Every movement you make, every footstep that you take in your training lab, they're going to be watching you, okay? And they're gonna be soaking it all in, all right? So this is the beginning of student engagement, your charismatic presentation. Okay, making that bond, all right? Creativity, um, you know, nowadays we can't just sit behind the desk and read verbatim from a book. Uh, we couldn't even do that in our time, right? When we're in college um, and the teacher would just read verbatim, world history teachers are good for that, right? Reading verbatim um, out of a book. The first thing that I do is I start thinking about what I did yesterday, what I'm gonna do today, right? You lose your students. If you stand in front of a podium or just stand in front of the projector screen, reading off a PowerPoint bullet, you know, bullets, one right after the other, you're gonna lose your students. You have to find a more creative way that is going to keep them engaged. Okay, and we're gonna talk about creativity in a bit. Um, consistency is very important that we stay consistent with what we teach, how we teach it, and what 
external resources that we use to supplement our students' training and learning. And then control. We have got to have control of our class. If our students have control, they may not have such a great outcome. Okay, so we have to be in control of our class. So these are the seven components, right, on becoming inimitable uh, as a nurse aide instructor. So now that I have my foundation, I have my framework built, now I needed to figure out, okay, what, what areas of each component do I need to master to become inimitable? What do I have to fix, right? So I came up with three questions or three question sets, right, for each component. And if you're able to answer yes to any one of these questions in each individual component, that will let you know what you need to work on, what you need to master and what you need to fix to become inimitable, right? Because you want to be that instructor that every other instructor wants to follow. You want to be that instructor that not only inspires other instructors, but you inspire your students, okay? So I'm not gonna go through all of these questions. I'm just gonna pick a few from a couple of the components, okay? Um, so with communication, I ask myself, do I communicate with my students on my level of education, my level of experience, and my level of expertise. And after reflecting on this question and reflecting on, you know, past training cycles and current training cycles, I sadly had to answer yes, right? You and I can talk to each other on our educational and experience levels, right? Because that's where we're at. But with our students, it's brand new to them. They don't, they don't know a bedpan from HIPAA, right? At the beginning of trainer. They don't know anything about OBRA. They don't know anything about patient rights. And when it comes to the skills, the testable skills, they don't know anything about authorized administrators or indirect care behaviors or skills. They don't know any of that. So with me answering yes to this question, I knew that I had to master the communication component of my 7C framework, and I knew the specific area that I needed to fix, okay? And then I have some other questions. Do I listen to my students, especially when they are silent? We have to realize that silence is the most powerful form of communication. When your students are silent, they're telling you one or two things. They're telling you that they understand what you're saying and they are getting bored, okay? They're getting bored, right? So you're gonna start losing uh, the engagement of some of your students. Two, they don't understand what the heck you're talking about and they are going to become frustrated and you're gonna start losing there, that portion of, of student engagement as well, okay? And then of course, you know, we, we need to give um, uh, routine feedback and constructive criticism, right? I'm gonna move on to competence and confidence. Remember, I told you that I, I link these two components together because as long as we're competent, we're going to be confident in our training and the same applies to your students. When they become competent in a testable skill, performing that testable skill, they are going to perform it with confidence during training, and they are going to perform it with confidence during testing, all right? So one of the questions um, that I asked myself was, am I, knowledgeable, am I not knowledgeable of how manual skills should be performed? And of course I answered no, because I feel like I'm knowledgeable, right? Of how they should be performed. And then the second part to this question box was, do I not know what the NAE is observing? I had to answer yes, because at that point in time, I did not know. Right, so I had to figure out how am I going to remedy this. Remedy this. My remedy was, I need to start networking with some nurse aid evaluators. And at the time, 
uh, the state of Texas was under uh, Pearson B for administering our tests, right? So I started trying to network and network with nurse aid evaluators, and I was blessed with one who um, actually wanted to share information with me. So a lot of the information that I'm giving to you today, a lot of the information that I share with my students and with my YouTube subscribers comes straight from the horse's mouth. And I was actually double blessed because this particular nurse aid evaluator was not only a Pearson View evaluator, she had also um, did some evaluations with Prometric. So when the state of Texas in 2020 switched over to Prometric, I was on my phone again, right? Right with her, definitely was. And then there are some other questions here um, that you can ask yourself, okay? Again, if you're able to answer yes to any one of these questions in each component, then you know that is a component that you need to master. And then you'll know what specific area of that component you need to try to fix because you have to be, um, you have to be mastered in all of the components to become inimitable, okay? Now with your charisma, um, one question that I wanted to ask myself is, do I know my person, my class's personality type? I'm sure that we know the individual personality types of each individual student, but it's really important for us to know the individual, or excuse me, the individual or the class's personality type, right? Because um, when we're training, we're training our class as a whole, not as individuals, right? So in order, again, to bond with your students as an entire class, it's important for you to know what is your class's personality type, and then you can match your charisma with that personality, okay? And then you have two other questions here. Um, Sorry guys, I'm trying to move this out the way. Do I have a connection with my class as a whole? And can I charm my students to remain engaged? So remember, I told y'all, charisma, having a charismatic personality that fits your class's personality is the beginning of student engagement. Now, Creativity, I'm gonna tell y'all a real short story, okay? Or I'm gonna make it short for you, okay? Um, when I, um, this was several years ago when I was um, consulting with another nurse aid instructor and it was a nurse aid instructor, I believe it was either Wisconsin or Michigan, I can't remember which one. And I started talking to her about creative strategies that she could use and, and she, um, she chuckled. And I was like, what's so funny, right? And she was like, girl, she said, I don't have an ounce of creativity in my bones. And my response to her was, do you have a right-sided brain? And she was like, honey, I have a right-sided brain and a left-sided brain. I said, well, boo, if you got a right-sided brain, you do have an ounce of creativity in at least one bone in your body, right? Your challenge is, pulling that creativity out, okay? Pulling that creativity out. And this is what led me to ask myself this third question. Do I inherit ideas from others? Then spice them up a little bit, right? To make them my own. If you feel like you do not have an ounce of creativity in your bone, and trust me, everyone does, okay? Because we all have a right side of brain. We just gotta, you know, pull it out of us. This is the best way to do it. This is the best way to start. I have inherited ideas from my sister who is a fourth grade math and reading teacher, okay? I inherited those ideas. I, you know, uh, took away some of the, you know, components of that idea. I added into, I mixed it up a little bit, brought it up a couple of levels, right? To meet the educational and training needs for my nurse aid students, whether they were my high schoolers or my adult learners. And I made it my own. 
okay? That is the way, if you feel like you do not have any creativity, um, this is where to start. Start inheriting ideas from other instructors, other teachers. They don't even have to be nurse aid instructors. Um, they can be academic teachers, right? Ask them what they use uh, to help keep, you know, their students engaged, okay? And then you have, do I teach mostly from my left brain or my right brain? Do I teach behind the desk? Remember I told y'all, if y'all teach them behind that desk, you gotta get up. You gotta get up, you gotta stand, you gotta move because your students are watching your every move they're listening to your every word, okay? So you gotta get up from behind that desk. And then do I step outside of the box or just rely on what I have available? Um, I actually had another instructor that I consulted that was using only internal resources that her program director instructed her to use and actually instructed her not to go outside to seek other resources, not a good idea. You have to, okay, you, you have resources, all right? Um, and these outside resources will not only help your students in the classroom, but outside of the classroom as well, okay? Um, and so let's go ahead and uh, move on to consistency. Now, um, here, I'm gonna choose this middle question. Of course, I ask myself all these questions, but I, I ask myself, do I stick with one external resources or do I utilize multiple external resources? Um, I utilize multiple external use resources, but I am consistent with those resources that I use, okay? So for instance, for videos, of course, y'all know I'm gonna use my own YouTube channel, right? My students are not allowed to watch any other um, training videos, okay? Except for my videos on my YouTube channel. So I'm staying consistent with that. Um, as far as nursing theory, the only um, site that I allow my students to visit is cna.plus, okay? So I'm consistent with that. Okay, so if you're using multiple resources, you just want to make sure that um, you, you, you stay consistent with it, okay, for each of your training cycles or each of your classes. Now, I actually got asked a question um, from one of my YouTube subscribers. And I'm, I'm glad, this was just a couple of days ago, as a matter of fact, but I have received many comments um, that are like the one that this young lady had um, sent to me the other day. Her instructor um, uses my YouTube channel for her students. But where the question was with this young, young lady was, apparently her instructor demonstrated how to perform a certain skill differently from how I perform it in my videos. And so she was left to ask, who do I listen to? Who do I follow? Do I follow my instructor or do I follow you? And you never want to leave your students having to ask such a question, okay? So you have to be consistent with how you are training your students to perform these testable skills. And you need to make sure whatever external resource you use demonstrates it in that same manner, okay? Or you're, you need to start demonstrating how the person, whoever created the video demonstrated it, okay? And it's a lot of videos out there, a lot of videos out there, okay? So just be careful about that, okay? Because you, again, you will have your students start to question who should they follow, okay? And if y'all are curious as to what my response was, I never step on any other instructor's toes. I will never do a fellow instructor like that. I told her that she needed to follow um, her heart. She needed to make that decision on her own or better yet, go back to your instructor and ask your instructor, okay? 
Um, control, all right. So here's some questions, the three questions. Do I set forth, implement, and reinforce classroom guidelines? Do my students know what I expect from them? And am I able to keep my students engaged, okay? I'm gonna go with this first question, all right? Do I set forth, implement, and reinforce classroom guidelines? Okay, I was able uh, to answer yes to that question. So this question, you if you answer no to it, right, you know this is what you need to work on. But I wanted to touch bases on this real quick and real brief, okay? Classroom guidelines are important. Um, the first two uh, reflection boxes actually should be linked together, okay? Because in your guidelines, um, you should also uh, indicate what your, your student expectations are, okay? Especially when it comes to the testable skills. But what I have realized when at the beginning, and actually I answered no, but I fixed this, right? At the beginning of my journey to becoming an admittable, um, I look back on my classroom guidelines and it was no self, no sidebar chat, um, no getting up while the instructor is speaking. No, 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 right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like so negative. It is so negative. Like if I was a student, all these no's would make me rebellious. You know what? When Ms. J's not looking, I'm going to see if I can get on my cell phone and text somebody or Instagram somebody, right? So when it comes to your student guidelines, you want to take away the negativity, okay? And, and only um, have positive, okay? Um, so instead of no cell phones, um, how I uh, manipulated my um, guidelines were cell phone usage limited during recovery or downtime. So I have a recovery time, right? Um, whether I'm doing lecture or if I'm in the skills lab training on testable skills, I give my students a recovery time. Some people call it a brain break, right? At least five minutes, right? Five minutes for them to decompress, right? Um, at this time, they can get on their cell phones if they want to get on their cell phones and text, right? Just for that period of time, five minutes, okay? And then the downtime when students are entering your class, right? Before you take attendance, hey, you can get on your cell phone, but once I take attendance, that's it, right? Okay, and then your second downtime is going to be the downtime that um, when you're closing out your instruction, you know, students are picking up stuff, cleaning up, and they're getting their things ready to go to their next class. Yeah, you can get on your cell phone then because I'm not instructing, right? So there is no negativity in that. And plus, your students are aware that at some point in time during the training day, they're going to be able to use their phone, right? So they're not going to be tempted to use it during your instruction and they will stay engaged, okay? So guys, that is it for my 7C framework. I hope you were able to take something away uh, from this framework, and I hope that you will be able to use it um, and become inimitable, because once you become inimitable, um, you will see a huge difference in your training style and also um, with your students' learning, okay? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move into training consistency. Now, I looked everywhere on Google for a definition for training consistency, and I couldn't find it, okay? So I um, thought about continuity of care, right? And so I started thinking about training consistency in the same regards as continuity of care. As nurses, we know that it is a process that involves the patient and key team, team members of the health team, right? That's charged with the maintenance of their care. So all I did was adopted that definition. I, I substituted patient for student and I substituted members of the training class for key members of the IDT, right? Okay, and voila, this is the definition that I came up with. Training consistency is a process that must involve the student and all members of the training class, 
they need your entire class needs to be involved with the consistency of training, okay? Um, all right, so five steps to training testable skills consistency um, or consistently. Um, you all would be surprised if I were to tell you on a daily basis how many comments or questions I receive on my YouTube channel asking me who administers the test for whatever state. And I'm there scratching my head was why don't, how come you don't know, right? Um, that's something that your instructor should uh, tell you like at the beginning, right? At the beginning of training. So it is really important for um, we as instructors to first of all, know who our state or country's region authorized administrator is and for us to inform our students of that as well, okay? Um, and also to inform our students of what that authorized administrator's skill requirements are, all right? Then you need to ensure that your training facility has sufficient supplies needed for your students to practice. Um, and I know some of y'all will probably disagree with me, right? Excuse me, on this, but if you would allow your students to check out supplies, that will give them a little motivation to actually practice outside of the uh, training environment, right? I know um, some of y'all may not have um, enough supplies to, um, you know, have your students to check out. That's understandable. Uh, some of y'all may just be plain scared, right? Um, that you may not get your supplies back or you may not get them back in the same condition that you loan them, right? That is understandable. But what I do is my students are able to check out um, supplies, okay, um, on, for five days. On that sixth day, those supplies have to be returned. And if they want to recheck them out, then they can recheck them out, right? And yeah, I'll be looking, making sure nothing is damaged or nothing is chipped or nothing is torn, right? So that's just a good idea. That's something that I do. Um, and I see really great results with my students' uh, students' performance when they actually do check out supplies, okay? So they have the actual supplies. If you don't, it would be a good idea that you know you tell your students, hey, look, look in your house. There are household, a lot of household items that you can use to substitute for the actual supplies, right? For a bed pan, you can use a frying pan or a baking pan, right? For a bath basin, you could use a small storage bin that you can get from the Dollar Tree or Family Dollar, right? So just give them some ideas of. Um, you know, uh, substitutes that they can find in their home to um, use as the supplies instead of having those actual supplies. And then again, communication, you know, we have to effectively communicate with our students. Um, we have to routinely observe and evaluate and give them feedback and corrective criticism, right? Or they're not gonna learn. Um, we have to identify it's good that if you identify which skill steps are most commonly challenging or forgetful for your students. Now, I know Pearson View, Credentia, and Prometric, I'm not sure about Headmaster or the American Red Cross, but they have a list um, per state of the steps, the most common steps that are incorrectly performed or the most common steps that are omitted. That's a good place to start. But is the entire state of Texas or the entire state of New York or the entire state of California, is that who you're training? No, you're training your students, right? So when you evaluate, um, you can do what I do. I have like a little evaluation sheet and I write down steps that are omitted and steps that are performed incorrectly. And then after all the students in that one class have performed that skill, I compile a list, okay, compile a list. Um, and so then you can actually focus 
on those incorrectly performed or omitted steps, right? Figure out a way that you can get your students uh, to remember to perform that step or remember how to perform it. And then again, observations and evaluations. I think we all know we need to do that routine, okay? So this is just a way that you can consistently train on testable skills. Another way uh, to maintain consistency uh, with training testable skills is setting goals for student success, okay? The power, the power behind getting or setting goals is allowing your students space to grow and improve. I'm gonna repeat that. The power behind setting goals is allowing your students space to grow and improve. So if you have your standards set really high, okay, anywhere from 95 to 100%, um, you're gonna start seeing a lot of frustration in your students if they're not able to get that 95 or 100% hack. You know, ProMetric, if you're testing under ProMetric, they only require um, 80% for each individual testable skill right, in order to say that student has satisfactorily passed it. Uh, for Pearson View and Credentia, uh, y'all don't work on a percentage. Uh, they use a cut score method, and I don't know what that cut score is, okay? I don't know the system that they use to get that cut store, score or create it. It is like top secret. Trust me, I have been trying for years, the evaluators, for Pearson View and Credentia do not even know um, what the cut score system is. But even so, even still, um, as Pearson View, Credentia, and Headmaster instructors, you can set a percentage um, rate that you feel comfortable with, right? Um, for your students to, or, or to gauge your students' um, competence for that skill. All right, um, but again, you don't want to set it really, really high. For the all of my skills, I have it set at ninety percent. Okay, ninety percent. Um, if you score ninety percent or greater, um, you are going to receive a satisfactory on that skill. Okay, it's not too high, where they're not going to be able to reach it, but it is higher than what is required from uh, ProMetric. And ProMetric is Texas's authorized administrator, all right? So I'm sure that we all know about SMART, okay? I'm just gonna briefly go over this again. You wanna make sure that your goals are specific, they're measurable, they're attainable, they're relevant and realistic, and they are time-based. The time-based flag is very important, why? because our students are being timed during their skills exam. This is just on this slide, I just have an example um, of um, one of my goals for my students um, when it comes to the opening procedures. The opening procedures is knocking on the door, greeting, addressing the residents, so on and so forth, okay? So um, my goal is that my students will perform opening procedures within three minutes with 90% accuracy. Is it specific, right? Yes, my goal is specific to opening procedures. It is measurable with time. I want them to be able to perform it in three minutes and accuracy, 90% accuracy. Is it attainable? Yes, it is, okay? Is it relevant and realistic? Yes, the opening procedures is relevant to the five indirect care skills, communication, infection control, safety, privacy, and dignity, and they can perform the skill. It's a realistic time frame. Okay, it doesn't take that long to knock, greet, intro, right, address, introduce yourself, and um, explain what you're going to do, and then do your little brief safety checks, right, and provide privacy. Not going to take long at all. Is it time based? Yes, I have it to where I want them to perform this within three minutes. Okay, so that's just a little example. Um, of how you can determine whether or not your goals are smart, okay? All right, guys, so here's another way that you can help your students when it comes to time, okay? And I've had a lot of instructors ask me, like, why do you time your students on the individual skills? They're not being timed individually during testing. 
I said, well, how are you going to know if your students are going to meet that time requirement for testing, right? For Pearson View and Credencia, they have to perform it in 30 minutes. For ProMetric, they get anywhere from what, 30 to 40 minutes, depending on uh, what skill set they have. And I believe it's the same for Headmaster. If you're Headmaster, you can correct me if I'm wrong, right? Um, but this is a time delegation, uh, skills time delegation that I started creating back in 2017 when I was started my journey to becoming inimitable. Um, and what I did was I would time, um, I would time my students for each individual skill, okay? And then I would average it out. And this is how I came up with the, the time delegation. Now I tell my students, this is not written in stone, okay? This does not mean that you have to perform hand hygiene in less than five minutes, or you have to perform dressing in less than 13 minutes. This is just a time guideline that can help you so you can see, you know, where you need to try to shave time off from, right? If you're not able to perform radial pulse within 13 minutes, um, if you have any of these other skills, where can you shave off time, right? You can shave off time when you're collecting your supplies. You can shave off time when you're navigating from the bedside to the sink, back to the bedside, okay? So again, um, the last time I did this, I averaged out the times was in 2020, okay? Just before we unexpectedly switched from Pearson View to ProMetric. So this is still good, but if you wanna do your own, this is how you can do it, okay? And then I have one here uh, for ProMetric, okay? I had to hurry up and do this back in 2020 when we uh, switched over, um, but again, you know, it's nothing set in stone. I will let your students know, just uh, let them know that this is where I would like for you to be um, when it comes to performing these skills, okay? Um, Julie, I'm gonna jump in here. I see how many amazing slides you have left, but there's only yes. eight minutes left in our time. So I wanna make sure people have a chance to ask questions if they have any. Okay, okay. I'll stop sharing my um, my um, presentation, okay? Um, yeah, if you have any like final wrap up or like one particular slide you really wanted to share, go for it. But um, I do, this one right here, the classroom organization, if you don't mind. This has helped me out a lot, okay? I'm organizing my class into um, a student council. So I have ambassadors, I have leaders, and I have peer coaches. Um, this is the setup, right? I'm the instructor. Um, then my right-hand people are my ambassadors. Then I have leaders, peer coaches, and team members. So I have smaller groups and I have leaders that can assist me with, you know, mentoring and training these testable skills. I just have a couple of short video clips that I want to show you. Uh, what I want you to uh, focus on is what... These students uh, Julie, are not participating. Julie, I'll just do, yes. Let's see if anyone has questions because okay. there are some people have, okay. that have to hop off. And then if okay. nobody has questions, we can switch back to the videos. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, Let I'll me get off of here. How do I stop sharing? Um, oh, I see it right there. Stop <laughs> sharing. <laughs> Perfect. All right, thank you so much. I. Um, of one of Julie's biggest fans, and thank you for the presentation you've done today. It's been really informative. Um, but while we only have a few minutes left, I just want to see if anyone has any questions for Julie while while there's time. Um, you can put your questions in the chat, or um, yeah, put your questions in the chat. We're going to send the recording to everyone. Um, and Julie, one person asked if they can get a copy of the slides. Is it okay to share your slides? Of course, yes. Yes. Okay. Are there any other questions for Nurse Jar, AKA Julie Reynolds? Feedback, thoughts? This is a chance to chat with Nurse Jar. Um, how do you get, okay, wait, one question. Pearson View test is based on 30 minutes or five skills. 
How do you get students to meet this goal if your complex skills take as much as 13 minutes? Um, well, like I said, this the time delegation is not set in stone. Um, a lot of these, the complex skills, your students, depending on their competency level um, and their fluidity, right, with performing the skill, um, they can perform it in less. Okay, so this is just, and you can do your own time delegation, which will probably be good for all nurse aid instructors to do, right? Um, time the individual skills, and then that time just average it out, okay? Um, so usually the computer, when the students register, the computer automatically generates the skill set for them. It's usually going to have a complex skill, um, a moderate skill, and then a simplistic skill. So if they're able to competently perform those simplistic skills uh, within an adequate amount of time and the moderate skills, um, they should still be able to perform their skills exam within that 30 minutes. I've had students um, to perform their skills exam in 14 minutes. Um, one young lady actually performed it in 13 minutes. But still, um, and this was the, their certification exam, still it depends on your students' competency level and their fluidity, how they're, you know, moving about. And most importantly, um, with, you know, whether or not they know what supplies to collect for each individual skill, because that can be a hang up when it comes to time if they're pondering over what they need to collect. Okay, great. We also have another question asking if your videos are geared to Prometric on YouTube. Yeah, I actually have a different playlist. I have a Headmaster, I have Pearson View and Credentia, because they're almost like one and the same, and then Prometric. Now, Headmaster, um, I, I'm not going to do any more videos with Headmaster because I learned Headmaster differs from state to state when it comes to the four mandatory skills and when it comes to the skills period. So I don't think I'm going to be doing any more Headmaster. But yeah, you can just go to the different playlists um, that I have on my YouTube channel. Okay, wonderful. Um, we have Joanne saying she makes a competition out of who can get it right and how fast. Yeah, that's, yeah. We I actually did a competition uh, with a supply collection challenge uh, with my students um, and they love it, it's challenging. Um, and they want to learn, right? Because they want to beat, they want to win that challenge. Um, I do the same for some skills, you know, who can perform uh, the skill more competently and in a more timely manner, who can do it the fastest, right? So it's just fun little challenges that you can do uh, with, your, with your class. Wonderful, Jennifer wants to know if your CNA game is available for purchase. No, <laughs> um, I actually stopped selling because I could not meet the demands. Um, but hopefully sometime in the future, um, I can get it back onto my Etsy storefront um, and to um, my, my website for purchasing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions? Julie, is we can invite people who need to go um, to stay to leave, but I would love to allow you to keep recording the rest of your presentation so that when we share it, um, people can see everything that you intended to say. And if anybody else wants to stay on, you can, but because um, I know you have a lot, a bunch more slides in the video you wanted to show. So if you have time, you can definitely continue your presentation so that it's available for everyone to see. Okay, I, I have about 30 more minutes before my daughter gets home from school. So um, let me go ahead and quickly um, share. And we can finish this up. Where am I at? And if anybody needs to go, thank you so much for attending. For those of you want to stay, I can't wait to see what else Nurse Jar has to say. Thank you for coming. All right, so this is the setup that I have. Um, when I train on the testable skills, what I do is I train my ambassadors first. I give them time to practice. 
And then I evaluate them. Once they are competent, they train their leaders. Now, while they're training, I'm looking on, I'm observing, right? This actually lets me know if my ambassadors are truly competent, right? Um, with how to perform the skill. And it just follows the path. And then the peer coaches, they're going to be the ones who evaluate their team members while their leaders and ambassadors and myself um, look on. Now, this is really good because um, if you have students who are struggling with learning the testable skills, any aspect um, of the testable skills, you can actually, you know, focus your concentration on that, you know, one or two or three students, right? While you're not holding back the other students. And that's what I love so much about um, how I have my class organized. Now, what I wanna show you all are two short video clips and I want you to pay attention, okay? Pay attention to what the students, what the students who are not participating and being evaluated or performing a skill are, are doing. So these are my ambassadors and they're um, evaluating their, um, yeah, they're evaluating their leaders. I'm sorry about that. She was, she was embarrassed that she felt her hands were all tapped. Okay, and now this next slide. Um, this is a slide where I have several activities going on. I have the class ambassadors are going over what supply items to collect for each skill. And they're quizzing um, their team members. And then I have a couple of the peer coaches actually evaluating uh, some of their team members on training. do you change your leaders? That's a question from James. Um, I, how frequently do I change my leaders? They usually stay in place. Um, I did have to change out um, two of my peer coaches um, because I let them know at the beginning, like, you know, with when I choose the student council, um, it's not set in stone, right? If you start slacking, I can't have, you know, student councils um, that are slacking. So if um, I have to change them out, I think so far I've only changed out, like I said, two up here coaches. And it wasn't that they were slacking. Um, they just weren't getting it. They, they just weren't able to like train their, their peers. So I had to switch them out, but they're very understandable. Um, I have students asking me, what can I do to become, you know, ambassador? And it's like, just continue doing what you're doing, right? And, and we'll see, we'll see how it goes, right? Um, but I, it usually takes me, my training cycle is a full school year. Um, and it usually takes me about a month before I actually, choose, you know, who I want to be the ambassador, who I want to be the leader and the peer coaches. Um, if you're teaching like a fast track uh, program anywhere, you know, your adult learners anywhere from three weeks um, to six months, then um, you may just end up having peer coaches. Um, when I, with my adult classes, 
Um, I just have peer coaches. I have, you know, one or two uh, that can help me with students who are struggling. Thank you for your question. So I'm gonna speed this up a little bit, but what I wanted um, was for you all in the chat box to tell me what you see the students who are not actively participating in an evaluation, what they are doing. If y'all don't mind sharing in the comments, in the chat. And while y'all are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and um, give you or, or tell you a good starting point um, for training your testable skills. The first, again, like I said previously, is letting your students know who your state's authorized administrator is. They, they have to know. Um, it's really important, especially outside of the training, they can actually go online, right, to, um, you know, view um, their state nurse aid um, administrator's website, okay? Um, and then what I do is I give my students a skills checklist, right? And it's not the nurse aid candidate handbook. Um, as Pearson View and Prudentia and Headmaster have, it's not the nurse aid skills checklist that Prometric has. I do a Word document and, and this is it right here, just an example. I have it in Word. It just gives them the list of skills, right? All 22 skills. And then what I do is um, I, I probably spend an entire week on the indirect care behaviors, communication, infection control, safety, privacy, and dignity, right? Because um, they are observed and evaluated on that from beginning to end of their skill test. And uh, sometimes when students fail, they don't fail the skills exam because of how they perform the skill. They fail due to too many inconsistencies with one or more of the indirect care skills, okay? And then I may spend like 15 minutes talking about hand hygiene, two or three days, right? I, and I go on and on and on. I try to get about three skills in per week, just introducing them, slowly introducing them to the skill. This does not look as intimidating as handing our students the entire nurse aid candidate handbook or the entire nurse aid, um, skills, oops, sorry, skills, um, hold on, skills checklist, okay? And so then um, I talk to them, like I just told y'all, I spend like about a week on the indirect care behaviors because it is extremely um, vital for all authorized administrators, okay? I think Prometric is just more upfront about it, right? Because they actually include that as a skill. Um, and then the supply items. Um, I you know, get them to learn the proper names of the supply items and then what supply items they need to collect for each skill. And then we start out with the demonstration and the practicing and the evaluation. So basically I, I start them off with baby steps, just slowly introducing them um, to the skills, okay? Instead of just doing it all at once, it can be very overpowering, very overwhelming uh, for the students. All right, so then I talk about the areas of focus again, the indirect care behaviors are very important. And as I said earlier, the steps that are commonly omitted, commonly uh, performed incorrectly, um, the order dependent steps, right? Where they have, um, you know, uh, wash, rinse and dry or empty, rinse and dry basin, right? You got to empty it first. You can't just go and rinse it and then empty it, right? So you focus on those steps and also focus on the multitask steps um, because you may have one step 
but there's three actions in that one step that your students have to perform. And if they don't perform all those actions, they're not going to receive a yes for that step. So these are just areas of focus that I feel are really important for us as instructors um, to, to concentrate on and to really try to um, you know, get our students to understand the importance of them. All right, reality versus testing. What is the difference, okay? What is the difference? Reality is uncontrolled, okay? Um, how you perform nursing tasks depends on the resident's condition, their abilities, their limitations, and their cooperation. Testing is a controlled environment, okay? Controlled environment. The resident is gonna be cooperative, okay? Um, you have a specific way in which your authorized administrator wants you to perform that skill, okay? Required actions only. Um, the abilities and limitations of that uh, person, if you're with Prometric or Headmaster, is explained in the scenario. Pearson B. Credentia does not use scenarios. They just have um, a skills a skill set, okay? Um, and it's less complicated, right? Because everything is controlled. It is very important that we don't intermix the two. Um, and one reason is because our students are being timed, if we have them performing additional unnecessary steps, that's gonna take away um, for their, from their time. It's gonna eat up their time, you know? Um, and I get a lot of comments on my YouTube channel from other instructors saying, oh, you didn't do this and you're supposed to do that. And I'm like, guys, that's not required for training. Like don't have your students do these unnecessary steps because it's gonna confuse them and it's gonna cost them more time, okay? <clears throat> So again, training your students to perform additional unnecessary steps and collecting unnecessary supply items results in poor time management and makes the skill more complex. Um, again, even with supplies, like you know, your if your student collects one too many washcloths, they are going to be standing there at that overbed table, wondering, "I got this washcloth." means I have to do something with it. What do I do with it? And it's gonna eat up their time until they realize, oh, I really didn't need it, okay? So really important uh, to, for us as instructors to um, make sure that our students are competent with what supplies they actually need to collect for each skill, all right? Innovative and creative tools development. Listen to your students, that's what I do. I listen to my students when they're, you know, talking amongst themselves, right, on how, you know, oh, I wish Miss J would have did this, or I wish Miss J would have did that. I'm listening. I'm picking up on all that stuff, right? Um, and that's how I create these games. That's how I decided to create my CNA uh, Quest board games, right? Um, and it started out as a nine by nine chipboard, okay? Um, inheriting ideas. Uh, again, like I said earlier, from other instructors, and they don't have to be nurse aid instructors. They can be academic instructors. They can be professors at colleges, right? Um, but just inherit it, give it, mix it up a little bit to make it your own. You want to cultivate um, ideas and tools into robust games, right? So um, here I have some business cards. I went to Avery.com and I um, made cards of the different supplies. Um, my students play a card game, right? Where uh, they try, it's like gin rummy. They try to um, get um, matching sets for supplies for each skill, right? And they have to be able to complete the supplies for at least five skills. And not only helps them learn um, the, you know, what supplies go for each skill, but also the proper names of the supply items. Cause I'd be getting tired when they be saying, you know, that pink thing, Ms. J, right? Um, if you want to get more extravagant, you can actually buy the actual cards and just use like a, 
clear sticky paper um, and print them out and put them on like a card deck of cards, okay? Um, I made crossword puzzles for both nursing theory and um, manual skills. The students love them. It gets them to think, right, about, you know, what they need to perform, the steps they need to perform. I actually was selling these on my Etsy storefront, but didn't get a lot of takers, so I pulled them. But I still use them for my students. They love them. It will help them to retain information. Um, you know, you can, you don't even have to go as elaborate as I did. Um, you can just staple them together, right? Um, I also made booklets for my students for the testable skills. I have all the information in the front of these little booklets, right? Uh, letting them know what their authorized administrator expects for them during their skills exam. And then I have my uh, grid sheets that I created. Some of y'all may already have them. I know I emailed a lot of them out to um, other instructors, but I've since updated them over the summer, uh, just based on what my students is, were telling me. Um, you can go to Amazon, you can buy the blank board games. Um, you don't have to go as elaborate as I did. You can use like your permanent markers uh, to make board spaces and just you know create a game, right? Um, when students are having fun learning, they retain more, okay? All right, in closing, networking, network, 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 network with instructors, network with evaluators, right? Build your own social media platform, right? So you can start gaining followers. Um, you know, I have, you know, um, people that ask me all the time, how did you start your YouTube channel? I started with one video, it started it for my class, and the next thing I knew, it just blew up, right? But you can do the same, right? You can do the same for your class and for, you know, to become inimitable, um, to help your students and other nurse aid instructors and other students around the globe. Um, really important to uh, network with evaluators, and hopefully you will be blessed uh, to, you know, uh, network with an evaluator who did not mind uh, sharing um, in-depth information with me, okay? Um, so guys, I think this is it, Charlene. Yes, it is. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, my email, nursejar1323 at gmail.com. My website, I have not updated my website in a while, but it is www.nursejar.com. This is my YouTube handle at Nurse Jar, my YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash C slash Nurse Jar. And this is my Google number. If you want to, you know, text me um, or call me, well, text me because I'd be um, screening my calls. So text me, um, you know, if you have any questions or if you have any comments. Okay. And that is it, Charlene. I'm done.